a First Baptist church from somewhere. A uh, pastor wrote this uh, summary up of a book by uh, Joshua Harris called Stop Dating the Church, and it really goes well with uh, this concluding part on the Most Important Things series, which is, are we, it's a good question, are we truly devoted to one another in brotherly love? Are we truly uh, selfless in our devotion? Do we really put others above ourselves? Do we really love one another with a selfless, sacrificial, unconditional, Christ-like, divine love? Are we truly devoted to one another? And so this, uh, I'm not going to go through that uh, packet. That's really for you to read on your own. I read through it and it greatly encouraged me and challenged me in my own devotion uh, to, to you all, in my own devotion to Christ and really saying, how many times do I say I'm selflessly devoted, but really Chad creeps way too much in there as far as a love of self or putting myself, my my own preferences, my own schedule, or my own desires above my wife or my children or my church. I think you all can relate with me that that's a great challenge to truly be selfless. So we're going to talk about selfless love, which is maybe a very basic definition of agape, of what we'll look at today, of divine love. Are we truly loving one another with a divine, selfless, sacrificial unconditional love, this agape love that Christ obviously has loved us. And I like, as Dennis read before, is that uh, 1 John 4 is my favorite passage in defining that love. First of all, it says God is love, but then it says he manifested or showed us the epitome of this love when he sent his only son to be the propitiation for our sins. All right, so like I said, we're looking at the most important things in life series. This is uh, probably this week and next week we'll conclude this little mini-series, a little break from... uh, Uh, our uh, Chronological Life of Christ series, we've said this is to edify the church, make this local church more excellent, more beautiful as a bride of Christ. And we went through and we talked about 2 Peter having due diligence. Are we doing our best for Jesus? Are we doing our best to make this church as the most excellent, beautiful bride as possible? Are we offering the Lord worthy worship where it's acceptable to God and it's not necessarily for us or for our own pleasing, but for God's pleasing as spiritual acts of worship. Because as John 4 says, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Then we've been on several weeks lately on being fully utilized with our spiritual gifts and knowing our gifts and developing our spiritual gifts, and, but fully with the goal of fully utilizing our spiritual gifts for the Lord's glory and exercising them accordingly. And now we've come to the end of this little mini-series on selfless devotion. Practicing the one another's. So maybe a little participation. I know it's a little, you know, uh, not to common in more of a sermon setting, but there's no rules for this. What would be some of the one another's that you think? Let's get so the top 10 one another's. What are, I'll, I'll start us off. Galatians talks about bearing one another's burdens. What are some other one another's that you just know off the top of your head? Spit some of those out. Not all at once. Okay. <laughs> Loving one another. Being kind to one another, tender-hearted, right? Forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven us. Spurring one another on towards what? Love and good deeds. How about some other things? Serving one another, right? How about praying for one another? Yes. Encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching, Hebrews 10. Good. Anybody else? Now they're starting to, we're starting to get it going. Some other one another's lots of them. Considering one another better, others better than ourselves. So we can go on and saying, are we practicing that? If you have your Bibles, look at Romans 12. We're going to just be dissecting three verses today. Romans 12, 9 through 13 is our text. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another. There's one. That's our main one another today. In brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Are we really doing all those one another's that we, we just read? This, this word here in, in our passage is this word, devoted. This is a, is a compound word from two words for love in the Greek, phylos, 
all right, or philo, which is brotherly love, and storge, or storge, which is familial affection, familiar, familial uh, concern, and, and dedication, and, and love. And so this word then is translated devoted because if you don't tenderly love, if you don't brotherly love, if you don't familial, have family type love, you're not going to be very devoted. It's just going to be another event in your life where you're like, well, I can take it or leave it, you know, those people over there. But that is not the words we're told to have as far as the church family. And I think many of us are devoted to our own biological families, but there is a sense uh, that we are to be devoted to our church family. And that is really what this message is, is about, is, is stirring up a greater devotion to one another as this passage commands us to. If we were to kind of back up and get a big 50,000 foot view, is remembering where this command started, an overview of love, uh, so to speak. John 13, Jesus is leaving his disciples with last minute instruction before he goes to the cross. And he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, so that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Will all of St. Mary's County know that we are his disciples, disciples of Jesus, because of how TBC loves one another? It's a good challenge. It's a good reminder for us all. Or John 15, he goes on, and, and this is a continuation. He later says, this is my command that you love one another just as I have loved you. And, and I have to say, how has Jesus loved us? Certainly with those three edges, selflessly, sacrificially, and unconditionally. And might we also, I'll say, uh, perseveringly, with, with all endurance, because when we let him down, he just doesn't give up on us. And when he, we have faults, we don't just bail. And sometimes I think that, that uh, sometimes in marriage, uh, we, we have trouble, but we don't just bail on our marriage the first time we have trouble. But oftentimes in churches, the first time we have any kind of trouble, people bail, and, and that's not the kind of love we're to have. Greater love is no one than this that he laid down his life for his friends. And we have to say, if Christ commands us in this passage to even be willing to lay down our lives for one another, how much more so working out our differences or how much more so really serving one another or really considering one another better than ourselves? And I think the American church really lacks in this. I don't think we would get an A in this in our own church. And it's hard to talk about because I don't have an A, and, and, and my dedication, my devotion, my selflessness is certainly lacking where uh, I, I'm preaching this to myself this morning. And he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give you. And he says it again, another time, to remind us how important it is. This is my command to you, that you love one another. I mean, this is being drilled down deep. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. NIV translates, above all, it says, love one another deeply from the heart. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Love doesn't expose a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. I had a chance in Sunday school to explain how uh, even a, a very painful uh, chapter in the life of church, we had a church split three years ago, and, and one of the main leaders of that church, we got together and we fully reconciled on Friday night. Praise God. That is a blessing where, you know, it wasn't that we rehashed everything and who was going to win, who wasn't. We, we held on to the good of what we loved about each other and those good qualities, and we just chose to forgive this whole list of things that have hurt each other and said, that's the past. I'm going to forgive you the way the Lord's forgiven me. And the Lord doesn't hang that over my head. It doesn't have that record. And we just move on and say, wow, praise the Lord for you, brother. That's what, that's what we need to be doing. If we went on and had time, we could read especially the book of 1 John. And that's why I had Dennis read in our scripture reading that love is, God is love. He is the source of love. And the greatest manifestation of love is when he did send his son as a propitiation for our sins. And, and we could talk about in, in 1 John 3, that, that we see that, that, that true love is, is to not just be in words only, but it is to be in actions and in truth. Don't just be lip service. Let's show it in the way we actually interact with each other, the way we speak to one another, the way we serve one another, all these ways. 
Look, look there again. He, this is uh, 1 John. I know it's a little hard to read here, but let me just read verse 16. We know love by this that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I, I can't get past that and say, I am commanded by my Lord to be willing to lay down my life for you. How much more does that mean I should then be willing to meet with others who or have something against me or reconcile or just choose to forgive and, and have an attitude of grace and forbearance that we have to have with our families because we know we can't just bail on them. But isn't it interesting? I read this week. Did you know it's a, a proven statistic in American church in the last 20 years that one in every seven churchgoers changes churches every year? Why? Because there's no devotion. There's no selflessness. It's all me, 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 and I, 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 and, and what can this church do for us? And as soon as this church isn't what I like or doing what I want, I'm on to the next one, and, I'm just, and I call it church hopping. And there's a lot of hoppers in this world, and I would say to you, don't be a hopper. Be, be a forgiver. Be a, a steadfast, devoted, one another type of, of believer. And that's why it says that, he says, by this, his little children, let us not love with word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know that we are of the truth and, and our hearts are sure before him, that in whatever our heart does condemns, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. But our heart does not condemn us, we have cause before God and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And I would say it is pleasing in God's sight when we choose to dwell together and brotherly love, right? It says in Old Testament, how good it is to see brothers dwelling in unity. And the one thing in Proverbs 6, he says he hates is when there is discord among us because this is not obeying the Lord's commandments. And so we see 1 John 4, as we read, 7 through 21 in our scripture reading, that because God is love, we ought to love our brother also. 1 John 5, 3, this is love for God that we obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. And you're like, wow, man, to love all of you in this church does sound like a burden. It shouldn't be. Because when you and I love one another, when we give forbearance, when we give grace, when we choose to hold on to the good, who are we truly loving when we love one another? We're loving the Lord. Because it says we're to do all things as unto the Lord and not unto men. Second John 1 says the same thing. He's talking about you, the lady. I think he's talking about the church there. He says, I'm, writing, he says, I'm not writing you a, a new commandment. But the one which we've had from the beginning, from the Lord's that place in John 13, that we love one another. And this is the love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as we have heard from the beginning, that we should walk in it. How are we walking? Are we walking in it? Do we have a divine agape love that's selfless, sacrificial, unconditional? And that's why this passage starts out this morning by saying it can't be hypocritical. It can't be hypocritical in the sense that, that we are not extending the same grace to others that we so desperately need ourselves. That we are not extending the grace to one another that we have already received from God. We have to do this because it's commanded of us and we're called to walk in it. Look at 1 Peter 1.22. Since you have obedience to the truth, purify your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. It's got to be sincere. And that's got to be fervent. Fervently love one another from the heart. 1 Peter 4, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. 1 Peter 5, 14, greet one another with a kiss of love. Uh, peace be to all you who are in Christ. There's, there's actually a real affection. There's actually a, a real fervency. This word in the Greek for fervent means hot. It's bubbling or literally boiling over. It's not like, oh, I gotta go to church again. Or, oh, I gotta go help that person move. It's like, when I do that, I'm serving my Lord, and, and I owe everything to him. Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. Proverbs 17, 9, he who conceals a transgression seeks love, but he repeats a matter, separates intimate friends. As we read it and looked at 1 Corinthians 13, that it is patient. It is kind. It's not jealous. It doesn't brag. It's not arrogant. It doesn't act unbecoming. It doesn't seek its own. It's not easily provoked. It doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. It's truly forbearing, and it believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. And that is in the context of using our spiritual gifts, that it's not about us. It's about him. How are we doing in that? 
Romans 12 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Boy, that's so hard to do, isn't it? Anybody struggle with this? To truly prefer others above ourselves. So men, how are you doing that with your wife? Anytime, you know, it's choosing where to eat or certain decisions, do you ever say, oh, I'm neutral on that. I'll just go with your preference just because I love you. Or are you the person who always known to get your own way because you're just too preferential to yourself? Where we give preference. We honor one another above ourselves. We don't seek our own good. We seek to the others above ourselves. That's, that's just truly unnatural. That's why it's supernatural. Romans 13, look at this. Oh, nothing to anyone except for the debt of love. Of a love of one another. And it says that he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. You've heard you not to commit adultery, not murder, not to steal, not to covet. But if there's any other commandment, it's summed up by saying you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love, basically love others the way you naturally love yourself. No one struggles with loving themselves, in my opinion. Love does no wrong to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. To do no wrong to a neighbor. Man, I, I just, uh, I think of, of just all the times where, you know, we so easily criticize other people. And I would just say, you know, in, even in our speech, can we honestly say that we, you know, we don't speak any wrong or, or critical nature to, to about one another to others? That's just so hard, and, and no one gets an A in that. Ephesians 4, therefore I, the prisoner, will implore you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent, really working hard to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Can I tell you, Satan would love to divide us and destroy this church. He, he has been trying for seven years. He works on my attitude throughout the week, right? I think all of you, if you're really honest with you, each other, you would say there are certain times where you're not very content with your spouse. You're not very content with your job. You're not very content with yourself. In fact, you kind of hate yourself so much. And you're certainly not content with your church, man. And I wonder, man, maybe if I just go up the road, will I just be a little bit better, easier, more convenient? You know, maybe I want to serve as much. I can just kind of hide out in the, in the in, in, and it just kind of be easy. But I say no. Galatians 5, look at this. It says, for you were called it says, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Uh, only do, uh, and do turn, it says, uh, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbors yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. They are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, carousing, and things like this which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, notice what's the very first fruit? Love. And then joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. There is, there is no condemnation. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. So if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another or envying one another. And this is in our homes. This is in our church. So the title of my sermon is Selfless Devotion. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And like I said, I'd like you to read this week as a little homework assignment, this, uh, this excerpt. It's a summation of an entire book, but in 12 pages of this book, Stop Dating the Church by Joshua Harris. He also has a follow-on book called Why Church Matters. And it's very excellent because this isn't something, by the way, we kind of think, oh, we're struggling at TBC. Did you know every church struggles with this? Every pastor I know has about the same things going on. And we got to be careful here that if someone comes in and visits our church, we just like, oh, we're, because we love the numbers, we just welcome them in. We, I have to make sure, hey, have you left your previous church, right? Have you sought out that pastor, the people you have issues with? Because otherwise, if not, I'm just being part of the problem, right? I'm enabling them to not go through the stages of Christian reconciliation and commit to their previous church. Boy, that's, that's kind of hard when you just kind of want to, you know, take in But it's like, I want to do to those other pastors the way I want them to do to us. And this, I think if you'll read those 12 pages this week, it does say obey your spiritual leaders. Would all of you read that? Is that too hard to give a 12-page assignment this week? Would you actually read that? 
and just pray and say, how can I be a part of the solution instead of the problem to really prioritize one another above myself? Let's get into the text, and this is what really encouraged my heart when I just saturated my mind on Scripture this week. Here is, is the Greek, and there's some great nuances here that we kind of miss when we just kind of read things very fast. But when we really meditate on Scripture, here's some things that come out. First of all, we see that the subject, the noun, uh, what we call the nominative uh, uh, noun, all right, and the nominative verb is about the divine love. Paul is saying, listen, you need to get the, the main subject, the main thing I'm talking about here is, is agape love in the church. So guys, get an A in agape, right? You need to get an A in agape love. And the very first thing he says is that it's not hypocritical. You see this, this um, alpha here, right? That really means not, basically, not hypocritical. And so this meaning is that it's sincere, it's genuine. You don't have to force yourself to do it, that you have a sincere love, a sincere divine love that you have because God's given it to you, because he's demonstrated to you, and he's enabling it to you through the Holy Spirit. But then notice this. The very first thing in having a sincere God love is hating the evil. Hating the, the ponderon, the, the, the evil, the, the wickedness, the bad, it's, it's whoring it. It's strongly hating it. Look, look with me very briefly at Psalm 101. Turning your Bibles back to Psalm 101. David demonstrates this beautifully, and it's one of the passages if you're struggling in hating your own sin or hating the sin in others. Go, go with me to Psalm 101. And, and look at the absolute holiness standard that, that David has in Psalm 101. It's a great passage, by the way, guys. If you're starting your thought life to memorize, so that, say, Lord, help me hate my sin. Psalm 101. I will sing of the loving kindness and justice to you, Lord. I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless life. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house with integrity of heart. I will set before my eyes no worthless thing. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. Or the NIV says, I will have nothing to do with evil. Do you hate the evil? Or do you kind of somewhat put up with it in your own life or others' life? And then it says, join or cleaving or holding on to the good. This is literally a word for glue. That you glue yourself to the good. You, you glue yourself, and I, so I, I translate that whole thing there in the Greek clause. The divine love that is genuine is hating the evil and uniting with the good or cleaving to it. How are you doing on hating the evil and clinging to the good? Are you holding on to the good? Are you cleaving to that which is good? Do you really hate your own sin? And that's why it's always a good prayer. We heard it together for the gospel. One guy said, the fastest prayer God ever promised an answer is this one. Lord, help me to hate my sin. Or help me to be broken over my sin. Have you prayed that prayer lately? That you, that you when it, the first way you would have divine love is loving what God loves, righteousness, and hating what God hates, which is evil. That's the first stepping stone, the overall view of what this passage is all about. How are you doing personally? How are we doing corporately? Verse 10. Then it says the brotherly love that is by, and it talks about the one and others, is, is into one another. Are you into this church? Are you into one another? Are you into serving? Because <laughs> it says the brotherly love is into one another. We're, we're into each other. I know I'm using a little bit of slang here, but literally it's by uh, a, a, that, that compound word here, phylos, and stergoi, a, a brotherly love and a familial love that's put together, which just means you're devoted to one another. You have a tender, natural affection and devotion to one another. You're in it for the long haul, just like you're in it in your marriage, and you're in it to, in your family. And it should be no different here. That you then honor, it says you honor, you prize others above yourself. And, and, and you're, you're, there, you're leading the way. You're, you're leading the way in showing this honor one. I translate this. The brotherly love is by loving one another devotedly, the honor of one another going before yourself. Or literally, you, you lead the way in the honor of one another. Men, do you lead the way in showing preference? Or are you kind of known as, well, dad always gets his way? Dad just kind of throws his weight around. And I would say, men, we should be the ones leading in giving preference and deference and saying, oh, hey, if it's, 
If, if it's, it could be done halfway a dozen others, yeah, let's go with your way just because I want to show you deference in Christ. Let's look at this next verse. The next passage, we see it's the diligence is not lazy. It's not idle. It's not shrinking back. It's hot in spirit. That means fervent or enthusiastic, bubbling over or, or literally boiling hot. And then it says, for the Lord you are slaving for. Literally, the diligence is not shrinking back. The spirit is enthusiastic and the Lord is slaving for. I would say to you, if you are tempted to be shrinking back in this church, if you are tempted in, in not being enthusiastic about this church, remember it's the Lord you're slaving for. And that any probably tempt of that otherwise is not from the Lord. It's from your own flesh or from division that Satan is, is creating and trying to stir up. And that's why it says, have great diligence to protect the unity of the bond of peace. Then we see verse 12. It says the hope is rejoicing, the tribulation enduring, and the prayer persisting. How do you maintain from not shrinking back or be enthusiastic or slaving? You remember it's the Lord you're slaving for, but you also remember the hope that we're ultimately going for, the kingdom. And so you're going to be enduring in, in tribulation hardship. And there are tribulations and hardships in every relationship, in your, in your marriage, in your family, and in a church. And so also you do this by persisting in prayer. Notice this. It's a continuing in. It's a keeping close company with is that persistence in prayer. And that endurance, it's standing firm, it's bearing, it's remaining, even when things are difficult and everything's not the way we want it to be. I think verse 13, lastly, it says, the needs of the saints sharing and the hospitality pursuing. Are we doing a good job at taking part in really sharing the load, sharing the burden, meeting the practical needs of others? And are we pursuing, even it says, like running after the opportunity to have hospitality with one another? It was interesting that if you looked at the Greek structure, did you know this is all one sentence? So it basically, the outline was perfectly right there in the sentence because it basically says the subject is love, divine love. And then it, it, it gave an overview, which says basically the overall thing is holiness, having, hating what is evil, clinging what is good. And then it has what we call 10 dative nouns. Dative just means three ways that modify the original subjective noun in ways that that noun, the means of it is conveyed. And then the last one is hospitality. So he says, basically, he starts with divine love. He ends with hospitality. But he says there's 10 things in the middle, which is how you have divine love. And literally in the Greek, it had the, the honor, the Lord, the spirit, the prayer, the needs. Do you see what I'm saying? It always had a, an article saying these 10 things. And so it kind of looks like this. The, if you want to have divine love in your life, you need to get it. You need to know it's, it's about the brother. It's about the brother. It's not about you. It's about the brother. It's about dearly loving one another with a Philadelphia love. Number two, it then goes on and literally says, it's about the honor. And by the way, this always comes first. We always kind of, in English order, we kind of put it, you know, diligently honoring. But literally, it's about the, the, the brother, the honor, the prayer, the Lord, because this is how then God is pleased when we love the way he loves. It's about the brother. It's about the honor of leading the way. It's about the diligence and not shrinking. It's about the spirit and boiling, making sure we stay hot and enthusiastic for the Lord and each other. It's about the Lord slaving for. It's about the hope rejoicing in. It's about the tribulation enduring. It's about the prayer persisting in. It's about the needs sharing or contributing towards. And it's about hospitality. Literally, the word hospitality means the love of strangers. The love of others more than yourself. And, and I would say, how are you doing in these 10 aspects of divine love? It's one complete sense. If you want to get an A in divine love, you got to then know there's 10 aspects here that really define the means of how the, the, the dative, the dative uh, case is, is something where it's, it's, part of the, it's the case of the indirect object and it indicates the means by which something is done or accomplished. If you want to accomplish divine agape love, you need to know the means. Here they are, 10 means or 10 aspects of divine love. Overall, divine love requires, I'm going to give you get 10 H's, all right? So you got to get a little, you know, I got to get my alliteration in there. I know some of you are like, you can't get away from those H's or those C's. It's just part of me, I'm sorry. It actually worked out pretty cool, all right? But I thought about this. If you hate what is evil and you cling to what is good, you know what that's called? Holiness, isn't it? 
So it's not one of the 10, but it's the overarching, kind of the overall divine love. It requires a holiness before God. You abhor what is evil. You cling to what is good. You love what God loves. You hate what he hates. And if you do that, then you're not a hypocrite. But if you are doing that, you're a hypocrite. Are you unfeigned? Are you unhypocritical in loving what God loves? I'm always con- convicted. And, and uh, Jason Pratt is good on this. He says, Chad, if, 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 if Jesus is sitting next to you in that movie or, or whatever you watched, would he be sitting there calling that a, a good movie if they're taking his name in vain? Would he be sitting there talking about what we talk about or saying, have a smile on his face? Or would he go out weeping about how it's a waste of your time or, or not glorifying him or, or had many concessions in the area of holiness? I'm convinced we all could, could be convicted in that area of things that, where we don't, as David said, we have nothing to do with evil. There's this absoluteness in that I can't get over and I struggle in the absoluteness. As long as it's not that bad. How many of you ever said that about a movie? Oh, it wasn't that bad. Or it only had one bad part in it, but overall it was a good movie. All right, well, if it had just one bad part, doesn't that make the whole, according to the Lord's definition of, of things here? But then let's look at this one. The first one, brotherly love. The next H is humility. Because if you, if you have a brotherly love, that is a humble person who has a genuine heart for people, especially believers. The Bible says do good to all men, but especially who? Believers. And as 1 Thessalonians 4, in that overview, it says the Thessalonian church had a heart and contributed to the needs of everyone in all of Macedonia. And that challenged me. Do I have a heart to see all the churches in this area prosper? Do I have all the, the true evangelical, the true gospel-believing churches, not just us, that I want, the, I want them, I mean, even if we say small, I want them to go large. If, if, they're, lead, if they're leading people to Christ, I want that because that's for my king's glory. It's not about a competitiveness. It's not about, oh, well, we're better than them. And how many of us get in this petty stuff about, oh, you go to that church, or oh, I heard things about that about that church. I'm like, man, those are my brothers in Christ. Those are people Christ died for. And if they're leading even one person to Christ, <laughs> praise the Lord. I couldn't mean, I didn't run that person to Christ. God had somebody else do it. If even God led one person to Christ, even through leading a Paul and Barnabas to the split for a time, and then later on, or like a John Mark, and the Bible doesn't tell us who was right, but at the end, Paul says, get John Mark, he's useful to me. And I would just say, do we have that kind of attitude in reconciling to one? That's what God's working in my heart in, and I hope he's working in your heart in, that you have a brotherly love, a brotherly kindness. You're a tender person. You're a devoted person. You're a dedicated person to the church. And you say, you know what? As much issues as, 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 and flaws as that person has, I love him. I love her. They're my brother in Christ. And God's called me to walk the straight and narrow with them. And even though they, if they stumble, I'm not going to throw stones. I'm going to pick them up and say, hey, I've been there, buddy. Let's walk together in love. Look at, too, the honor. This word honor means it says, it literally, it says, give preference to one another in honor. The word honor means something you prize. Do you prize each other? Are, are, you, going, are you going before and leading the way in, in a diligence, a spude? <laughs> Number three, do you have a diligence? Oh, and by the way, the H for that was honor, all right? So there were several H's. That's how I got the idea. Uh, number three is that are you, are you working hard for the things of God? It says, not lagging behind in diligence. You're not shrinking back. You're not idle. You're not lazy. Or it even has the idea of troublesome. You're not causing trouble, as it says in, in Hebrews 13, 17. It says, obey your spiritual leaders. Make it a joy for them instead of a burden. Are, are you making a joy, children, for your parents to rank under them? TBC, are you making it a joy for your elders as flawed as we are? Are we, getting, are we a gracious, forbearing church? Number four, the spirit. Are we hot? Are we keeping? Or are we getting to be that, that revelation condemnation where it says, you're, you're neither hot nor cold. You're just lukewarm. I want to spew you out of my mouth. I don't want to get that way in this church. I want to remain hot with the spirit, which means I have an enthusiasm. It's this wind of the, of the Holy Spirit that keeps me boiling hot and keeps me pursuing the good, keeps me pursuing people and evangelism, and it keeps me pursuing the Lord's glory because that is what I'm made for. Or if you're honest tonight, or this morning, would you say, I'm kind of lukewarm, Chad. I'm kind of just so-so. 
Or maybe, if you're real honest, I'm just cold. I really don't care. I think that's always the thing that I'm concerned about the most in my own heart when I start to say I don't care. I'm really saying something that's it's unbiblical. I'm saying I don't care about what God thinks. I don't care about what that other person thinks. We should care what people think. Not more than what God thinks, but we should care about that person and be, care, be careful of the I don't care attitude. It so easily invades us. It's, it's against the, the, what the Holy Spirit produces in our spirit to keep hot for the Lord. Number five, the divine love heeds, right? It hupotassos, right? You know that that's the word it means to, to rank yourself under. We, and it says, remember, it's the Lord, the Kyrios, the Lord Jesus Christ is our, our master, and we are his douloi, his slaves. And literally it says the Lord, if you were translating the Greek, the Lord slaving for. How are you doing with that? Are you slaving? Are you being a good doulos? And are we as a church good douloi? Slaves for the master? It's not about us. It's about him. Number six, do you have hope? Are you maintaining this agape love by hoping in God and not in man? Your hope's not in the government. It's not in the military. It's not in yourself. It's not in your family. It is in God. My hope is in God. And that's why it says, make every opportunity to share the reason for the hope that lies within. My hope is in the coming kingdom of God. My hope is in King Jesus coming back to fix everything that's broken and, and wrong in this world. And I have no hope in myself. Our hope's not to be in each other. Our hope is in Jesus who lives within us, amen? If your hope is in me or in Dennis or Calvin or, or any of our deacon candidates, you're gonna be severely disappointed at some point. You'll get disgruntled, you'll go cold, you'll become one of the seven people who just find the next church down the road. But you know what? People who hop keep hopping, don't they? Don't be a hopper. Realize I have a hope in here. I have a rejoicing in here. I have an expectation. And I am called to be glad and to rejoice in how many things? All things. It's amazing to me. When I look back at the worst things in my life, my mom's cancer, my parents splitting up, on Marissa's side of things, her, her, her dad's church failing and shutting the doors, Marissa and I would have never met unless the worst things in our life happened. That's how our dads got to meet. Isn't that crazy to think that the worst thing was necessary to bring the best thing? But our hope is in God. Our hope is in heaven. And we can rejoice that God does work how many things for the good of those who are called according to God and love him. All things. Praise God for that. That's our hope. And we should be rejoicing. The tribulation, guys, I hate to tell you, there's probably more tribulation. The stress is coming. It's not going to probably get easier for us. It's going to get harder. But one thing that's good is I think it says when the going gets tough, what? Tough get going. If, if, if we had to depend upon each other for food, shelter, survival, don't you think we would love each other a little bit closer? But because we have such independent lives in America, we're like, oh, I don't really need my brother or sister here or there. Not true. When we have more distress, we need to patiently endure endure and endure together we need to be like that phalanx where the left side of the shield covers the right hand side of the man and then that formation singularly for many almost a thousand years of uh, revolutionized warfare why because they were linked together they were stronger together than one man and i would say to you where is the left side of your sh uh, shield covering the right hand side of the guy next to you or those of us in the ranger battalion, we say, never leave, obviously, your ranger behind, your, your battle buddy. And I would say to you, don't leave us behind. Wait for us. Endure with us. Endure. Be persevering in tribulation. Number eight, and, and by the way, the H there, obviously, was hold on. The divine love holds on in the face of adversity. Number eight, the H is habitual. Are you habitual in prayer? Because I would say, this church needs to pray more. If we can have one application, it's that, Lord, we're... We don't know how we're going to grow. We don't know how we're going to lead people to Christ. We don't know how to do some of these things, but you do. And so God, our hope is in you. Our power is in you. Our dependence is in you. And we attend Proscatoretto. We attend constantly. Can I say to you, I don't know if any of us right now, and this is where you can pray for me, are any of us attending constantly, day in and day out, is that prayer warrior on our knees where we're going? We truly are devoted to one another, but also because of that devoted to prayer, because we believe in that much in prayer. This, this, this uh, family reconciled with, they've, they've recently adopted four Ukrainian orphans. 
And my heart was just, just filled with joy, and, but also just amazement because this little girl who they adopted cared for her siblings, three of them, on the streets at age 8 to 10. And she cried out to God, God, give me a mom and dad. God, reconcile me to my brothers and sisters who were put in different orphanages at different points. And I tell you, it shouldn't surprise your pastor, but when I thought that God heard the prayer of that little girl, he heard her cry, and he gave her a new mom and dad. And I said, Lord, why should I be surprised? You hear our cry. Am I surprised that God answers our prayer? Are you surprised when God answers a prayer like reconciling us to that family or hearing that little girl's prayer? Or as Adam said, a healing his elder uh, at his home church in, in Pennsylvania, should we be surprised? Or we should say, no, that's my God. He does that often. In fact, he does it so often. I get that back from prayer all the time. I kind of expect it now. Do you have expectant prayer, regular prayer, persistent prayer? Because you know if you ask anything according to his name, according to his will, he will what? Do it. And in the context of that passage in 1 John, it says, because we're born again, we're his children. And God loves to do that with his children. If my kids come and ask me for something, do you think I'm like, no? Right? I'm going to say, I might say no for another reason, but <laughs> we don't have the money or, you know. But I would always want the best for them. And have we forgotten God wants it? But we got to go and get it. We got to attend it constantly. We got to ask him. And I would say to you, the biggest failure I have ever had as your pastor is I am not on my knees more. And saying, that's where the power is. That's where the hope is. And, and praying more for you. But I would also say, are you praying regularly for me? And Dennis and Calvin and, and all these needs we've presented in the last couple weeks. Are we truly a praying church? Or is it true, as, as I said, we've had to return in this church, basically commensurate with the level of prayer that all of us collectively are doing? I believe that 100%. So let me ask you, if we ask God to fill these pews in this next year, not because it's for our own glory, but because we, numbers are important in this sense, because we care about a soul spending eternity in heaven or hell, would God do it? He would. Have you prayed about it? Or are you just content to shrink back and, and, and just kind of coast along? I don't want that. I don't want to be a shrinking church. I want to be a growing church for the right reasons, because I care about people. I want to pray that dangerous prayer because it's not my responsibility to fill this pew. It's not Kevin, oh, we just got to get the best music leader or better preaching or we got to end on time or we got to do all this performance things and have this great performance to woo people's ears. You know we're not doing that for people. We're doing this for the Lord. But I'll tell you what's the difference. When's the last time you were bold enough to pray for your neighbor, invite them to church or share the gospel with them? Are you doing your part to grow this church? It's not, it's not my response. It's yours and mine together. I would say, have you forgotten people in your own life? Have you forgotten your neighbors to pray for them? Forgotten about your family members to pray for them? Are you devoted in prayer? And should you be surprised when God does an amazing thing like that? No. Number nine, the needs. Are you helping others in their practical needs? When's the last time you said, hey, do you have any practical needs I could help meet? Well, actually, you know, I'm having trouble paying this bill this month. Or, or actually... You know, if you could just watch my kid one day a week so I can go shopping, I have one hour of sanity because as a mom, I'm, I'm a little bit going crazy. Sometimes it's just a little thing. It's even a little visit of going over and, and just dropping over, play a cookie, say, hey, I just wanted to drop in and just say, I care about you. How are you doing? Or a little phone call just says, hey, I'm thinking about them praying for you today. How are you doing? Are you, are you helping others? Are you sharing in their needs, sharing in their burdens? And, and how, that's a good question for a date night or even for a friend. Hey, what are the burdens in your life right now that I could be praying for? What are the things that are burden, a burden on your heart? If we were truly honest and had a vulnerability and a love on that level, all of us would have probably could come up with a list. I'm burdened about this. It's a sin struggle I've been having in my life for a while. Or I have a burden about one of my kids who's you know, just his attitude or her attitude or, or their actions just not quite, you know, in line fully hot for the Lord. Will you pray for that? And, and are, we, are we okay to admit things like that are hard? Or I have a burden right now with you know, maybe a health scare. There are some here in this room, and I know it's, you haven't given me permission, but there's some people who are burdened here because of cancer in their family. Do you guys even know about it? And when I knew about how I've been regular praying for them like I'd want them to pray for me. Am I wanting that kind of, of love? And then lastly, the hospitality. Sorry, I get for the camera here, airbrush this, okay? <laughs> 
The divine love eagerly offers hospitality. It pursues it. It doesn't complain. Remember, Hebrews says, offer hospitality without complaining because why? You've entertained angels unaware. I don't think the last, I don't know the last time I've inter- entertained an angel unaware. But it, it literally, this word means dokeo, means to, to, to pursue it, almost like uh, an army f- uh, pursues a fleeing army. I don't pursue it like that, that's for sure. I'll do it if I have to, but I ain't going to pursue it. But we should. Literally, hospitality means the love of strangers. Do you love the lost? And I have to say, Lord, I don't. I don't care about half these people in my own heart attitude. That's why I got to pray for Lord, remember the five dangerous prayers I've taught through the years? Lord, give me your heart for the lost because I naturally am struggling with that guy or that person. Lord, give me an opportunity this week to witness. Lord, help me to take the opportunity because I'm scared and I always don't have the courage to go through the door. And Lord, once I'm in the door, give me the words to say. And Lord, help me to leave the results up to you. Have you prayed that lately? Lastly, let's get the application. Read 1 Thessalonians. The Thessalonian church was one of the more mature churches. Corinth, not so much. We studied that. But the Thessalonians, they, eat, they begged Paul to give. They shared the, out of their poverty and met the needs of not just one church, but all the churches in their entire area. They were a selfless, devoted church. And I call this church by the grace of God, and I call this church to have grace on me because I'm with you all in the struggle, that we would be a Thessalonian, selfless, devoted church. Amen? I call us to this because it's a beautiful thing. And, and notice how what he writes here. He says, now may, the, may, and this is as we close, but just hear the words of Scripture. They're better words than mine of what I could ever write. And he says this, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Notice this familiar love Paul had with the Thessalonians. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. That's my prayer for us as well. Lord, help that be true at TBC. And for all people, not just these brothers and sisters in Christ, but for all people, break my heart over people because that's God's heart. That's what a God is. He has a heart for people, all people, just as we also do for you. So that he may be established, your, that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. First Thessalonians four nine through twelve. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have need for anyone to write to you. Now I hope that someday we can say Paul could write that to us. But guess what? He would have need to write that to this church, wouldn't he? But the Thessalonian church says, "I don't even need to write it about to you because you're already getting an A." But he says. Is this because you yourself are taught by God love one another? For indeed, you do practice it. Wow. And it towards all the brethren, all believers, not just in their local church, the universal church. Wow. All who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Some of you are great in this. Excel still more. Some of you are weak in this. Starting excelling a little. Okay. <laughs> And all of us in between, let's do our best. We excel still more and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, attend to your own business, and work with your hand just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly towards outsider and not be in any need. Working hard, doing our best. First Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another just as you also are doing. For we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you. I think he's speaking about their spiritual leaders. And he says, we request you, brethren, um, and charge o- who have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, everything, give thanks for the, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And that, my friends, is God's will for TBC. We end with these two verses. 2 Thessalonians 1.3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you towards one another grows even greater. Can you join with me in this application prayer and say, Lord, grow my love for for my church and one another even greater. I have so far to go. I have not arrived. 
I am so selfish at times. I am so prideful at times. I am so uncaring at times. I am so callous at times. I am so much feel like giving up at times. But Lord, may I end and then and get an A in, in Hebrews 10, 23. And I call you all to this. Let us hold fast. Amen. Let us hold fast the confession, our confession that Jesus is Lord. Ties back to our sermon. The confession of hope without wavering for he who promises faithful and let us consider how to stimulate one another on towards love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of son, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Can I tell you this? Summertime, we, we have lots of people who, who obviously have trips, vacations. That's, that's fine. But if you see someone you haven't seen in a while, just kind of slowly, their consistency just fade off. Can I, can I urge you? Let's all pursue them in love. It's not just part of my job because you pay me. Hey, that's your job to call those people and find out who's kind of sliding into the cracks. No, it's all of our job. Let's pursue them. Let's love them. And if some of them go to a different church, that's fine. Let's, let's, let's pursue reconciliation to the highest level possible. As far as it be upon us, we pursue peace with all men. But let us keep striving after and being faithful with those who want to be faithful. Amen? And that's my commitment to you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray you would help me to put this passage into practice. Lord, I, I admit to you, Lord, I, I'm weak in these ten aspects of love. Lord, we are weak in many aspects of love. Lord, there's a part of me I don't want to go witnessing the community next week. There's a part of me, Lord, I don't want to, to go to Edgewater and witness to another to help build another man's church because I feel like my own church is, is very weak right now. Lord, there's a part of me I'm selfish. Lord, there's a part of me that I've become lazy. I want to shrink back. I, I want to move on to, 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 Lord, to easier ministry. And Lord, I realize that doesn't exist and I've just been selfish. Lord, forgive me. Forgive us, Lord. Increase the love of the brethren here. Help it grow deeper. Help us to excel, excel still more. And Lord, may you help these 10 aspects of divine love be true of us as they were in the first Thessalonian church, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.